So uh, thank you for being here. And I'm now going to talk to Shannon, who's going to introduce you to JC, and um, and we're going to talk about uh, talking through generations. Hi, how's everybody feeling? Yeah, I am. Give your brain a big break here for a second. I um, again. I'm excited about this because I we got it. This is only the second time I've seen JC face to face, and only the first time I've seen her face to face in three dimensions. So I'm kind of excited. Um, she looks, she's taller. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, got a chance to talk. Um, gosh, my phone was it a couple months ago um, with JC over Zoom about what this could look like, and I was so enchanted. We had this kind of idea of what the conversation could be. And it's one of those cases where, much to the point of the conference, if you open yourself up and you listen, um, it took a different direction. And it was really, it led to something different um, than what we originally anticipated, which was super exciting. Uh, one of the things that uh, we acknowledged that was part of the foundation of this event, I talked about it a little bit, just touched on it a little bit last night, was the idea of talking across generations. Um, we have, I think in this room a lot, I was, I was, I was thinking about it with the listening session earlier this morning with um, Seth and Craig, that there was a 70 year age difference um, within that listening circle this morning. Um, that's astonishing. And it's also really lovely to see. And I think what we saw today was a case where you know, listening and learning across generations is the goal, and it's something we try to do. But it's not always what we see happening. I think when I spoke last night, I talked about that there was a chasm in, among generations, and a lot of it had to do with some of the things that uh, that Stephen has talked about and that Christine has talked about, which is the inability to listen. You know, that us we get all so caught. I do it. He gets all so caught up in what you want to get across. If you don't stop and listen to what somebody else wants to say. So when we were speaking with JC um, a couple of months ago, she started telling stories. As we originally thought, this would be great. Let's see if we can talk about, you know, some different aspects of, you know, both this person and the culture and how do we bring this into the conversation. And then all of a sudden, she started talking about challenges with deep dealing with her, her grandparents and, and how, her, how she's teaching her daughter to, to respect um, traditions and talk about their own culture. And at the same time, there was a lot of relevance to what we were saying and also some lessons to be learned. And all of a sudden we went, ooh, this is what we need to do. So I'm, I'm, I was enchanted. I know you're gonna be, so what we wanna do is just have a conversation. Again, it's gonna be similar format. We're just gonna talk. Um, mostly I want JC to talk and then we will open it up to questions again we'll probably about 15 minutes and for those of you folks again online you're going to be welcome to to ask questions and join us as well so sound good yeah all right sounds good so let me tell you a little bit about JC she's a, an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Reservation born and raised in the Mission Pendleton area she drove here from there last night so she grew up in the tribal longhouse traveling Indian country in the Powell Trail and medicine dances learning how to preserve cultural identity and teachings from her grandmother Loretta Lonnie Alexander Pinkham a lot of us know the Pinkham family here following in her footsteps as a gatherer picking berry digging and drying corn the outdoors have always been a retreat throwing out in the Matilla River with her uncles fishing hunting and her brother Rob or gathering wood and teepee bowls all the these teachings have seeped into her artwork, expressing her dedication to preserving our culture and identity for the future of our children. So I, you also, you work with uh, our Nesper School of Homeland here. You're also with Crow Shadow too, that's correct? Yes. And you're an artist. So yes. would you want to tell everybody a little bit about that? The, how you blend those two jobs together? I'm just curious. So. Um, well, actually, I think the jobs found me. Um, I worked um, for the Past, before I started these jobs, um, I was working at the Yellowhawk Optometry Department. Um, we brought in an optometrist, we contracted an optometrist, and then um, I just kind of put my head down and was working in the medical field, and I was starting to become burnt out because I couldn't, um, you do the same thing every day, and it's the same tasks every day, and you're just trying to get to one thing a day, and um, I wasn't able to be creative in um 
the medical department that I was in. And I thought that it was me, like I wasn't doing enough. Where am I supposed to go from here? Um, and then I took a break from the, I took a break and um, I just stayed home and I sewed and the creator um, brought me these jobs. Um, next person while well, home lens came up because I took myself off social media. I thought that I was getting too much and I was getting judgy or maybe like, oh, is that where I'm supposed to go? Is that where I'm supposed to go? And it wasn't where I was supposed to go. It was where other people were supposed to go. So I took a break from that and I just wanted my life to be a little bit quieter so I could hear where the creator needed, where the creator was telling me I needed to go. Because I think that we forget that the creator already has a plan for us. And then we're trying to make our own plan when the creator already has it laid out. And we're like, no, I'm going to go this way. No, I'm going to go this way. And he's like, no, I'll show you. And so um, I was quiet. And then off social media, um, all these people kept screenshotting this job for a nice personal at Homelands. And they're like, it's you, it's you. Um, so then I was like, oh, I'm going to apply for that job. And I was like, oh, there's so many cool people going to apply for this. I'll never get it. <laughs> And then they're like, you got it. We want you. You're the person. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I feel so thankful, you know, because my grandpa raised me to be this person to um, take care of the land that I was put here to take care of the land so the land can take care of me. And so I get to be this outside person. I get to be I got to be a little boy with my grandpa. My grandpa said, oh, you want to do that? My uncle said, oh, you want to do that? Come on, then. And so I got to go out and be in the woods and go throw rocks when they're like, oh, the fish are running that way, go throw rocks that way. You know, I got to be that person. They allowed me to be that person. And so um, this job kind of found me. And then I waited around a little bit longer and then Crochetta called me. My uncle Philip actually called me Philip Cash Cash is my, my mom's half brother. Um, so he calls me and he said, Crochetta's gonna call you, answer the phone. <laughs> so I said, okay. And so I thought it was going to be like an interim job, you know, and I was going to be able to help Crochetto out. And Crochetto has been a big part of my life. Um, the first workshop I took there when I was 12 years old with Joey Labrador. And then the first um, the first workshop that I got to be the host of was for Joey Labrador, which like makes me kind of emotional um, because I got to make it full circle. I got like they raised me to be this person. And I always told my grandma, oh, um, I just want to. I just want to be paid to get be Indian to teach people to how to be Indian. And um, I'm, I'm living the dream right now. You know, I get to be, you know, my outside self and, you know, wear boots and not fix my hair and no makeup um, here. And I get to play in the dirt and tell people to come play with me. And then at Crochado, I get to put my head down and do all the crafts that I did with my grandma. Um, we had a, she had a sewing room. Um, Ever since I can remember, I don't remember the first time I used a sewing machine. Um, it's been just instilled in my life. I have a sewing room at home. I also opened a small business in March before I got offered the job here. And so I have a small business, two jobs. And then my daughter um, just got elected to be the Happy Canyon Princess for this year. Thank you. We'll be really busy. <laughs> Which I'm looking forward to because she gets to go into start her story and begin her story, you know, and people get to pour into her cup. Yeah, do you all notice how many family members she mentioned in that intro? You know, how many mentions of the grandmother and her grandfather and her uncle, Philip Cash Cash, and we've had some exposure to Philip Cash Cash, and I know from my own personal experience, he calls and says, you're going to do something, I'd say, yes, sir, um, but but your daughter, um, and I, I wanted to start, because we talked a little bit about this before, you know, we've talked here about generational divides. Um, we started this with the op opening. So thinking of things like, you know, the boomers and the Gen X and the OK boomer and millennials don't, you know, they, they, they just don't know how to work and all the stuff that we hear. I'm a slacker myself. Um, <laughs> so as we think about our generations and, and how we define generation gaps and kind of this homogenized European white U.S. culture, what does what what do generation gaps look like? For you, what has been your experience and how do you address them in, you know, either you and Tony Nesper's families? So when I think about generations, it's a little bit different than like boomers. It's like I, my generation, me and my cousins, me and my brothers and sisters, my mom's generation, my grandparents' generation. That's kind of like how I lay it out. Um, so I think that um, I think with colonization, uh, some of those gaps have widened. 
because we don't get to have intergenerational homes anymore. You know, like my, I see my grandparents every day, every day that they, you know, my grandpa picked me up after school every day. My grandma took me to the bus stop in the morning. My mom was in college. And so she was really working really hard. So my grandparents became more parents, you know, and they had time, they had time for me and they had a little bit more patience for me when my mom didn't. And now my mom gets to have patience for my daughter. So I feel like, um, like sometimes today, kids don't get all of these people trying to help them stay on their path. And it's their path, not our path to choose for them. And so I think that sometimes parents get caught up in saying, no, that's not the right path for you and not letting their kids figure it out. But there's not enough of these people on the sides keeping them, hey, maybe that's not the right thing to be doing. Hey, don't be doing that. Hey, be quiet. Somebody is talking. You know, um, in the longhouse, if you come in the longhouse, anybody can correct you whether you know them or not, because that's a home. That's our longhouse home. Everybody there is family. Whether you're related, we're all come to that home because we want prayer. So we're all looking we're all the family there so we can all correct all of those kids in that home whether we know them by name or not mm -hmm. and so i think um, some of that is getting dismissed like um some parents don't want their parents to discipline their kids and i couldn't ever imagine saying to my grandma if she was telling my daughter something say don't talk to my daughter that way you don't have the right i would never say that to my grandma my grandma's word is law even if my mom said it was, even if my mom said, don't do that, I'm like, hmm, might test it. <laughs> but if my grandma said it, or if my grandpa said it, that is law. I, I would never, I would never want to break their rules. Mm -hmm. And that goes beyond just your immediate family, as yeah, you were saying. That, so I think that yeah. is in my culture, that, um, that your grandparents are always the top. They're always at the top of the totem pole. And I think that there's a pecking order that isn't in necessarily everybody's family. And I, I can't compare to, I can only compare it to my family and what I, the, the place that I live in is, you know, the oldest one is always in charge because they earned it by age. They earned it because of experiences. It doesn't matter if they have more money or they have um, more degrees. They earned it because they've been on this on this earth for longer. And I want to give them that respect. How do you instill that with your daughter? How do, what are the challenges with that and that carrying on those traditions, especially as, you know, again, with the, you've mentioned social media, but, you know, with the impact of the outside culture trying to come in and maybe model something different. How are, how are you finding that? I think, um, so we kind of laugh about this because my daughter went over my notes after the <laughs> questions. <laughs> when you sent me the questions and we talked about this and she read my notes and we were laughing about the no cussing rule. Because I don't I don't mind that she cusses behind my back. I don't mind that because that's with her and her friends, you know. She asked me if she can say the S word or the H word or, you know, whatever. And my daughter's 18. She's an adult, you know, <laughs> technically. Um, but I want her to know that she there's a time when you have to turn that off. Mm -hmm. There's a time when you don't need to be cussing and being a little kid and being disrespectful. I want her to know that if there's people in the room that are older than me, that she needs to put on respect. Mm -hmm. You know, with her and her friends, they can be in their room cussing around or doing whatever they want to and joking. But I need her to know when to turn it off. What do you think the benefit is to her for that in the long term? Well, what I tell her is she's not out there just representing herself. She's representing me. She's representing my grandma. And her in this position that she's in with Happy Canyon, she's wearing a lot of the regalia that I wore. She's wearing a lot of the regalia that my grandma wore. She's wearing regalia that my my cook my cook is my my grandma's my my great grandparent. So I call her my cook. And it's not her name, it doesn't mean great grandma. Pook means the relationship that I have between her and I. So she calls me Pook and she's my Pook. That's the relationship. So when I say my grandma, she's my Katza, that is our relationship. That's what it means to us. She's not a name. This is what we have between each other. Wow. That's so 
as you're an observer then looking at as you don't come from that experience, what do you what do you think the biggest gap, you know, you're working with folks from different generations, you know, both with Nesbitt Blah Homeland and also with um crush out of what do you see as the challenges um, that are coming up as in a leadership role? Um, I think my biggest challenge is I don't know what it looks like not in the Indian community. Mm -hmm. So uh, me, I I grew up in a native household. I, I go to a native church. I go to Washa and I go to powwows and I live I live an Indian life. Um, so I don't know what it is to be compared to something else that I haven't lived. And so I think it's hard for me to explain how I live my life to other people that don't necessarily live the same kind of life that I do. Because I live with I live with Indians that practice the same religion as me, and we have the same goals, and we want to make it to the same place. Um, so I think it's hard for me to explain to people that aren't Native why I do the things that I do, or. Or for me to look at myself and be like, oh, I didn't notice that I did that because everybody else does that in my family, you know, about talking with elders and always making sure that, you know, about active listening and not um, not trying to interrupt them and making sure that they know that they're important, you know, so I'm trying to tell my daughter, hey, don't interrupt or don't be on your phone when people are talking, it's rude. So we have like the no phone at the dinner table and stuff like that so that we can have face-to-face -face conversations, you know, and when I get upset with her, I tell her why I got upset. Like, you know, they always tell you there's a feeling before anger. So when I get mad at her, like, oh, she didn't take the trash out. I asked her 10 times, you know, and now I'm like, now you didn't do this, this, you never, or you always, or whatever. And um, and then I'm like, oh, I was angry because I was getting overwhelmed um, because I thought I feel like nobody's helping me. So can you help me take out the trash more often? So you own that. Yeah. And, and then I can say, yeah. sorry, I'm so sorry. I I feel bad because I don't want to blow up on her because I want us to be able to go back and forth. I don't I got to watch the relationship to, between my grandma and my mom and they it, they got along but they didn't communicate. Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of assumptions in that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw the relationship with me and my mom where I'm like, oh, I want to rebel. Mm -hmm. I want to rebel. And it doesn't matter <clears throat> if it's good for me or not. I'm going to go test it. And I, and I wanted to close that gap with me and my daughter. So I wanted to be able to put it on the table so we could talk about it. You know, like I want to talk about, hey, um, we can, it's okay to say sorry, but I need you to mean it. If you don't, if you're not sorry, then don't say it, please. You know, about, about saying what you need instead of, oh, I don't have anything. I don't have this or that. Being like, hey, do you think that you can help me out with it? And just asking, and it, if you get a no, it's okay. You know, it made me feel really good as a parent as um, I got to be on the interview with her at her Happy Canyon interview. Mm -hmm. And um, they're asking her, you know, if you weren't chosen, um, would you try out again? And she is like, well, if I've not chosen, um, it just means the creator's just telling me that it's not the right, um, it's not the right choice for me at this time. You know, and if the time comes around again and I want to apply, and I have the feeling, oh yeah, I would want to apply again, then it might be the right thing. Like the creator is putting in, in my path. And if and if he's not, if it's not a choice, then it's okay because the creator chose it for me. And I was like, man, it makes me feel good that I'm doing the right thing. Right. And that was my way of telling back to what we talked about this morning with modeling behavior. So do you see a difference in the quality or the type of relationship you have with your daughter? Um versus, and I don't want to put them in contrast basically but the like you experiences with your mother i mean how did the, that experience of her um inform the way i mean you talked about it a little bit but how did that inform the way you treat your daughter do you think you have a different relationship with her at this point than you did maybe with your mom when you were 18 yeah definitely definitely because i think that me and my siblings want to call each other on our trauma instead of instead of saying it's okay you know, like, oh, we're going to call each other on their trauma instead of just saying, oh, well, I'm that way. At least I know it. You know, like saying, yeah. oh, I'm stubborn. At least I know I'm stubborn. 
And but you're not willing to change that. But how are we going to change that? And how do you want our relationship to be better? Because I don't want to walk around in the, my own house and tiptoe. I don't want my daughter to tiptoe around me. I want her to be able to say whatever she wants to say if she needs to say it. And I want her to be able to say, I don't want you to say anything. I just need a hug from you. Mm -hmm. And then that's okay. And it's okay to cry. And then we joke about it after we're all, oh my God, my cry face was like this. You know, <laughs> and, to make, and to normalize, you know, crying and to normalize saying sorry to each other and that it's okay if I got overwhelmed. But realizing, hey, like when I get upset with her, I'll just go in my room and I'll close the door because I don't want to say something that I didn't mean just because I was her feelings. How hurt people want to hurt other people. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to spread the ugly. I'm trying to gather all this light from my heart. Mm -hmm. And if I hold on to darkness, I can't let the light in. And I want to be as light as I can when I meet the creator. Because I have to, I have to present this book to him. This is how Google Armin told me. So we live our life every day and we're creating this book of our life. And when we get to where we're going, I'm going to have to present this to the creator. He's going to go through my book and he's going to go through it and he's going to say, hey, right here, why did you do that? I go, because it was the right choice for me and my family at that time. And I don't want to be, because, because I was being selfish and I didn't want to do that because my mom told me and I didn't want to listen to her. You know, I'm going to have to explain that. So when I tell her when she's making decisions, I go, based that on the creator, you know, because there could be two good choices, but one could be more self-serving. And I don't want to choose that if it's going to be easier for me at that time, but I'm not going to benefit from it in the long run. Maybe that's how I need to judge it. And what's cool is when I started doing this, it was like a good choice and a bad choice. And now I have like good choices and good choices or a better choice in this choice. You know, it's not a bad choice and a good choice. Now I have good choices to choose from just because I just do that every day. Like what is the best choice for me? today for me and my family and if that's too big like how big how good is it for my creator and it can get bigger and bigger and if the creator is too big I put it on my grandma because I'm like <laughs> oh what if I told my grandma I did this what which what, what would she look at me like you know because she wouldn't say oh my god that's so great or like I'm so disappointed you know she wouldn't say that it was the look you know? <laughs> and um I did that with my my what I sell, you know, I bring it to my grandma and the less she says, the better I know I did. Ooh. You know, like when I bring my the dresses I create, now I bring them to my Auntie Marge and I, I say, um, here, here's the dress I made. And I don't say anything. She flips it inside out. She looks at it, she goes, hmm. And then I'm like, that's it? <laughs> you know? So um, it's different because in my culture, it's just judged different. And so when I'm not in my own community, I have to let a little bit guess more, guess more where it's coming from because about talking to other people because I don't know how it is in your family. Right. I just know how it is in my family, in my community, in my own longhouse. But I want to make sure that my daughter is respectful when I'm not looking. That's what I want. So because. you said she mentioned, you know, you were she saw your answers as you were preparing for this. Um, I'd be curious because originally we were hoping she was going to join us for this conversation. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what her take, what you think her take is on on that experience. Is she grateful for this? At 18, you're still she's still in the rebellion piece, but does she? You think she sees what you're trying to do and in, instilling those values? Yeah, I do. I think that uh, me and her created a great relationship with each other because she's not just my daughter, she's my friend. Mm. And I feel like um, sometimes my mom would get on me about quit trying to be her friend. I'm like, but why? I want to be her friend. You know, I want to be her friend, but I, I get to be her mom first, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't have to be her friend all the time, but I can be. And so I think that... Um, me noticing the difference between me and my mom's relationships and hers I just got to learn from it and then we get to work on it together um because say well alcoholism was a, a part of our lives you know and my mom drank for a little bit longer than me and then I quit when I was 32 and then hopefully my daughter doesn't have to start that and that's the same way, way that our conversations can go 
we had a little conversation and a little bit more and a little bit more, and maybe she won't have any of those fights with her daughter that me and her have had. And so I think our trauma can just get smaller and smaller because we're talking about it. We're not just assuming it's gone or pushing it under the rug. We get to talk about it. And she gets to learn what I said to my mom and what I regretted about the relationship with my mom. And I get to explain to her why I did the things I did and I hope she doesn't do. But I also get to react different than my mom because my mom didn't have somebody to talk to. My mom was a really young mom. You know, she was still growing up when she had me. Sure. So even her relationship with me and her relationship with my baby sister is different because me and my sister are 16 years apart. She was a different mom when she was born, you know, so I had to partially be their parents too. So I get to be the older sis the oldest sister. So I was already a parent before I was a parent. But, you know, I got to learn from those things and then give them to my daughter. I'm curious, you, you speaking of, you know, as you spoke about how generations really are generations of your family as opposed to the labels that we put on them in, in the United States in general. Um, speaking of siblings, I mean, with a 16 year age gap, or assuming you have cousins that are, you know, <laughs> yeah. 10 or 15 or 20 years older than you are, does that same respect apply inside a generation? So, because you're the oldest sister, is there uh, an implied you know, you again, you've been around the fun a few more times, maybe you know something. Yeah, they can call shotgun all they want, but I still get the front seat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even though I'm the smallest, I don't care. I will still yeah. fight the hardest. Yeah. And I think that um, some of our generations are a little bit mixed up because my grandpa is the oldest sibling and his youngest sister had a daughter that's younger than me. So okay. my, I have aunts that are younger than me, but then by default, they're kind of just go on the cousin generation scheme kind of by age. But like, we don't go by great aunts or great uncles. I don't really know what that means either. So like me and my cousins are my, my mom, her siblings are all on one generation. I just called all of them un uncles and aunties. And then all my grandparents, cousins brothers sisters are all my grandparents nice i don't i don't know what the great means exactly yeah. um so i think by me calling my grandparents siblings grandparents also it gives them more respect and like my grandpa's my grandpa's brother's daughter is my aunt i don't think i would call her my cousin because that would take respect away from her because she was like a second mom to me. So, but when I talk to her, if I don't call her my Aunt Lori, I call her mom because she earned it. Okay. So I have kids, even though I only have one daughter physically that came out of my body, I have multiple kids that call me mom because, you are because they think that of me. And I'm glad that they do. And I accept that because um, I get to be a safe space for them. And that, that feels good to be the safe space. I, uh, I I asked this, I put this in the questions ahead of time. We are not sticking to the script because we've met, right? So um, I wanted to know though, can you share a story about how maybe you helped somebody of an older or younger generation help kind of cross any misunderstandings that might come from different generational experiences or helped explain that to your daughter or somebody maybe to your grandmother you know, to help understand maybe what's going on even with a technology issue or something, but how have you been able to help folks come together across different generational understandings? Um, I think that my biggest, um, the biggest thing that I came across is when I started working for um, Willamette's Purse mm -hmm. is um, I have, there's a lot of, there's a lot of older people native on the board and have to explain the way that they communicate to non-natives because um, my elders are a little bit harsher in their words. And it's not that they're trying to be mean or that they're trying to um, like make you feel less of, they're talking to you harshly so that you remember so that they don't have to say it again. So I think that sometimes the, the tone of voice is um, listened to a little bit too much. 
Mm-hmm. You know, like, I don't think that you're hearing what they're trying to tell you. I think you're hearing the tone in their voice. You know, like when you're like, oh, they just keep getting mad at me and lecturing me. But what are they lecturing you about? And, and I think that they probably said it once before, but you didn't hear them. So they talk sternly so that they only have to say it once. And it's not what, and they're not really talking to you. They're talking at you, but it's because they don't need a response from you because they, because they know, you know, that's something they know about, you know, and why would I question that? And I don't think that they should have to offer to be questioned. Um, So I think that sometimes we don't give them enough respect or some of our kids are forgetting that they live longer than them. Because they're like, I know everything on this phone. I can look everything up on this phone, you know? And so then they're like, oh, well, I know. I have that feeling too, you know? But I thought I knew everything. But now I'm like, oh, shoot, you guys want me to talk about what? (laughs) You know? Because I feel like I'm still a kid, that I'm still the learner, that I'm still the student. But it feels good to me. It feels good that I'm... I'm growing into this person and that um, people want to hear what I have to say, but it's not really my words. They're the words that were given to me. Cause I feel, I feel like um, all these people before me, they poured into my cup mm. and then I get to pour into everybody else's cup, but, um, but then it's not filled with me. You know, it's not filled with my teachings. It's a little bit of my grandma, a little bit of that. And all of that came from somebody before her and somebody before him somebody before them and they all poured it in that all made it to my cup and it's so cool that my cup gets to get overfilled that i get to pour into other people's cup what a responsibility and how lovely i i'm curious about um how those conversations go um i know we've been on the receiving end um i will speak for me of having a, a stern conversation with somebody um a, a native elder who I learned through my own experience to take it as if they didn't care, they wouldn't say anything at all. Um, and, but it took a minute because you're, you're absorbed in the culture that we have. If somebody looks at you sideways, you know, uh-oh. Um, but really understanding that that was, that was a difference. So how, how did you help explain that to, to some of the folks on your board that, you know, the white people on the board that, that didn't understand, you know, how do you explain that without being... Um, I, I just take I just take them aside and say, hey, I just wanted to explain the communication a little bit. Um, what what this what this man said, I noticed that it hurt your feelings, but I just want to tell you that he wasn't trying to hurt your feelings because then he joked right after. Right. Because then we break the silence with joking and awkwardness. <laughs> um, you know, where like I don't know, Indians are really good at putting humor into really awkward. <laughs> situations you know at funerals i think that if you went to a native funeral you're like this is a funeral all these guys are joking because we are uncomfortable in the you know we're uncomfortable so we joke about it yeah it's not like we joke about crying in at our house and then we're like were you in here crying bro yeah i feel better now <laughs> You talked a little bit when we, we spoke, and I can't remember exactly the phrase, turn of phrase you, you, you used, but I remember it, it stuck with me, the idea that you do kind of tear each other down a little bit just to kind of get yeah. attention. Could you talk a little bit about that? I can't remember exactly. Roast. Roast. So that was it. Yeah so, yeah. so my grandpa was a great roaster, um, <laughs> and I think that um, made it a little bit more lighthearted about um, correcting ourselves. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like when me I lose my keys and my phone and my shoes a lot so and my grandpa's like oh well if you took your shoes off the same spot every day you'd probably find them you know about roasting you like that about that or picking up the garbage oh you walked by that piece of garbage 10 times now you're 10 times as mad because you could have picked it up on the first go by because you know like little things like that and about like our uncles um, roasting us but it, it corrected us in a fun loving way you know like well pick your damn shoes up put them away he could have said that you know but then then I would have been like oh you know and it wouldn't have been as funny but it makes it a little bit more lighthearted about getting roasted and then when somebody says something to you outside that's not in your community you can just let it slide right off because you're like oh and and being being able to accept things 
that are for you and to not accept things that aren't for you. Oh, can you talk more about that? What does that look like? That's, um, that's like well, well, sometimes, um, let's talk about like kind of like in religion. So um, my, my I, I grew up in the Long House, so a lot of my religion, it comes from the Long House. But um, my grandparents from Warm Springs, Lola and Don, so happy. They taught me. They taught me how to be, um, to get what I need from each religion that I needed. So my grandma liked a lot of Holy Gospel, and we went to Shaker Church, and um, I have Shaker religion in my family, and um, we go to Catholic Church every once in a while, and there's all these different stories that I can take parts of for myself. And I don't have to say, oh, this religion is not my religion, but these stories make sense to me and I can make that for myself. So I have my own personal religion that doesn't belong to anybody else because what the creator is trying to do is trying to find a path to my heart. And however he can make it there, that's what I'm looking for. So I'm not saying, oh, um, I'm not I'm not Christian, so I can't accept any of those stories. But I can take lessons from there and I can take stories from there and I can take songs from there so that I can make this path to the creator in my heart, because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to collect all the light. And I think that, I think that's what more of us can do, like even here. Mm -hmm. So some of the words that were said didn't necessarily pertain to me in my life. So I can leave them here for somebody else. But there's some words in here and some teachings here in this room that I can take for myself to make my my life better and I can give to my daughter and I can give to my niece and I can even give to my mom you know so I think that there's pieces of things that we can pick up in um, unexpected places so looking at I'm gonna zero you in a little bit on Malawi County and I know this is a new position for you but you've heard a little bit about you know some of the conversations we had earlier and now you're taking on a new staff and a new challenge there. Um, what do you see as maybe challenges? And it doesn't have to be specific to generations, but challenges with some of these issues we're talking about, conflict and coming together in conversation, that you think you might be able to have an impact on? Um, I think that, um, I guess if we're talking about generations, I think it's a little bit harder for some of our elders to want to let go of what they know has worked. Mm -hmm. So I know that um, some of some of our elders have prying hands and they want to give you something, but they want to make sure you're taking care of it good right. and they don't want to all the way let go. And by you telling them that it's okay that or <laughs> telling them that you're accountable without having to tell them. So I, I, I'm proving it to them before I'm saying I can do it. I'm proving it in actions so that they believe me. But that's what I have to do to my elders. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like um, I feel like sometimes the disconnect is culturally and generationally. Yeah. Um, so it's harder for me to talk to an elder not in, that's non-native because I don't know where they're coming from. Because um, I... Cause I I, I live my life. Don't know. Yeah. I live an Indian life and I don't know what a different life looks sure. like. Um, so I think my mine is um, trying to live in these two worlds because I'm starting to step out of my own community and into other people's community and being able to understand and listen and put myself in your guys' shoes so that I can see how we can build this relationship with natives and non-natives in the program that I work in. And I think that's what I have to be like, oh, it's okay that I don't know. And me and Kelly talked about that too, because she asked me lots of questions, but I also don't know. I don't know what it is to live in a non-native community. So um, I think that it's good for me to listen and ask a lot of questions. And I'm really good at asking lots of questions. So um, I think that as long as we can keep our communication open, I think it will be better. And being able to tell the elders on my board that it's okay to let go if we bring um, younger people in. And, and saying it like, hey, here's the idea I have. What do you think about it? It's just saying, this is what I want to do and this is where we're sure. going. Being able for them to have opt in or opt out, not just saying this is what I'm doing because I don't know better than them. I don't. Um, and I think just making sure that they know or hey, if the technology is not there, if you're 
I think technology is a big barrier too with um, my elders and me, even me, because I'm not as big social media person either. And I'm not, I don't hook the TV up or anything. That's all <laughs> my kid. <laughs> um, so I think that is a little bit of a barrier um, with generation just because technology is moving so quickly, it's hard to keep up. And I think it's hard for um, some of my elders to let go of the, to trust in technology. That sounds like it's elders across the board. It's, it's the elders. elders across culture. So are you, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm curious. I know with, you know, the, the homeland has folks that are part of that community that are considered elders mm -hmm. across communities. So do you, it's the same kind of issue you're seeing? Yeah, I would say, yeah. well, in my perspective, but see, my perspective is just, a, sure. I only am taking a half step out of my community right now. Right. So I'm assuming that it's the same um, across other technologies or other elders that I've worked with that are non mm -hmm. Um And I guess just making sure that, um, making sure that I'm communicating with them the best that I can and that our communication styles have to be sometimes different with, with my generation and younger and then my generation and older. So I contact um, the people on the board that are elders. I'm calling them and I'm texting them. I'm not sending them emails or asking them to fill out um, all these Google forms because they probably are not going to do it anyway. Right. So I'm making sure, you know, I'm I'm changing my communication style so that I'm making sure that they know that they're important and I'm not leaving them behind. So what have you learned or, you know, as you're going through this process, because it's, it's now, again, you, you see what happens, you talk to her and you're like, what, what, wait, I want to go over here. Um, as you're entering into this community and as you say, you're just starting to, to, to kind of learn more about different cultures. What did you? What would be the, the maybe the number one piece of advice you would give to someone in your community or someone in our community that is trying to do the same work after what you've learned so far? What would be the first thing you would tell them in building those relationships? What's the most important thing to do? Um, to put down the assumptions mm. because I think I have assumptions and usually they're not correct, mm -hmm. and so I think that. Um, and I, I'm kind of like a high strung person. So then I'm playing, I'm playing the tape out a million times, you know, like what could go wrong here, what could go wrong here, what could go wrong here. Yeah. But then once I got here, then I'm like, oh, I like it here. <laughs> <laughs> and like this talk, like when we agreed to do the talk, and then I'm like, oh, why do people want to hear what I have to say? You know, um, but then I get here and then I'm like, oh my God, why did I sign up that for that? I'm going to be so nervous. And then it got to the week that it was here and I'm like, oh, I'm freaking excited, oh, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think that um, just like our judgment changes. And I think that if we're just kind of like um, what we did in that thing where you can say it a different way because mm -hmm. it sets the stage um, a different way. And I think that's what I try to do with my daughter. Um, you know, I'm not like... Um, do this or else, you know, it's like, can you help me out? Because I'm getting, feeling a little bit behind. Mm -hmm. And so if I say, set the stage different, I'm more apt to get help. And so I want to set the stage, you know, for my, I want to set the stage for my daughter to make sure that she's going to have a success, successful life. Mm -hmm. And that means being a good human being. That doesn't mean having lots of money. That doesn't mean having a house of her own. That doesn't mean having a car of her own. I want her to have her own life that belongs to her. Like good human being and trustworthy is the basis. It sounds like you're well on your way. So that's that's amazing. Um, I I'm checking through my list here. I I think what I want to do for a minute, just because we're um, it's late and it's everybody's getting a little sleepy and the sun's going down, and I want to give a little more time to ask some questions before we kind of go on. Is there who has questions? Who would like to to ask something of our new? Yeah, I just sorry. Have Please, uh, comments. We're question. going to let you do comments a little bit. No, I just have a weird question. Can this be archived so we can listen to it again? It is being recorded right now. Okay, and yeah. you're going to put stuck it up on your Maybe. website? Oh, or if you buy a mug, do you think you can have one? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's pretty good for four o'clock in the afternoon. What do you think, Kelly? How's that for a fat defender? Okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, this is being recorded right now. Anybody have any questions? I do have a question. Yeah, <laughs> So 
let's say you don't agree with something what your grandparents says. Do you, is that does that ever come up for you? It's kind of like and it doesn't. No, I love this. This is beautiful. You no, I would I would never question them. You know, they filled my cup up the most. How about your mom? Oh yeah, me and my mom will will go rounds. But <laughs> since we've gotten older, you know, and the, the we're both living a sober life, it's so much easier for for us to find what's in common nice. and to say like, oh, we don't talk about that because we argue about it, but that's not something that matters in our everyday life, so we can put it to the side. And if we disagree, we just disagree, and that's okay because we have our own spaces to go. It would be different if we lived in the same house, but right now we don't. So, and and our basis is different because um, her she lives in my our family home, and so that's always home that you can go to. Like if I ever wanted to just go home, my mom would be welcoming to have me home. She's always like, "Oh, you want to move home? You should move home." And I'm like, "Oh my gosh, you know." And that I think that's different in non-native communities oh, sure. because we're focused on like you can get your own home, get your own stuff. But we want to stay together. Um, I, I don't want my daughter to move out, and I, I hope she does it for a while. And that if she does move out, the, her option to come home will always be there. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Uh, okay, Mike. Um, just thinking about my relationship with, with, with my elders, um, I'm wondering how in your culture you would relate to an elder who has you know, maybe starting to to show signs of dementia or senility, or they're not making sense, or they're they're having trouble uh, uh, following following things. I mean, do you what what is what kind of relationship do you have with with, with an elder like that? Um, I think that. Um... The only relationship that I had like that was with my great grandmother, and she passed away when I, I think I was around eight, when my great grandma passed away, and I remember her, you know, getting a little bit like more angry um, in her dementia, and I hadn't seen that part of her, but I think that um, my great grandpa, he was very adamant about us surrounding her, you know, with with us, with our presence, so that she knew that she was loved. And any chance that of her catching a memory again or remembering where she was at or who she was with was important that we were there. So, you know, we still brushed her hair and we would never move her out of a home. And any of our elders that are sick, we always move them into our family home. So my uncle, um, my uncle got really sick and he was living um, in his own place, but he got sick and we had to bring him on hospice. So we brought him to our family home. So that it's so that you get to leave somewhere peaceful, somewhere that you that you're comfortable at, and to remember that there's people waiting for you on the other side. Um, so I think that um, that um, it's kind of like the process of like, hey, my grandparents took me care of me when I was a baby, and I owe that to them to take care of them. So I think it's given just a little bit more attention. So when our elders are getting sick, we're, we're surrounding them more. Yeah, I appreciate that. What if someone like that were, were giving you advice, though? I mean, I mean, you talked a lot about respecting oh. the advice that you receive from your elders and how that, you know, you don't question that. But if someone is is in that kind of a state and giving you advice, then, then how do you respond? I, well, I think if it was advice, um, it was given, they're giving it regardless, you know, even if they thought that they were 20 years old and that's not where they're at, I think that it's still advice and I can take it pieces or I can take the whole thing if I need it. And I think sometimes if you don't think it's a good advice, you can leave it. But um, I haven't been in that situation, so I'm, I'm not sure. Kelly, did you have a question? Well, um, JC was talking about sharing what she's what has been poured into your cup and giving that to people. And what you shared with me 
is that I just thought was so profound is how you are still giving back to the people that gave the people that are on the other side, like using your very life to give back. And I was hoping you could share what you shared with Ryan and I at lunch about why you stay so busy and what that means to you. Um, well, I feel like I, it, it's owed. I feel like some of the stuff that it, it, it's not given to me to keep. So my, my, all these people that gave me all these gifts, it's my duty to um, pass those gifts on to other people else I'm going to lose it mm. or else, or else all the teachings that my great grandmother gave to my grandma that I gave were given to partially to my mom and then gave to me. And those are all have to be gifted to somebody else. It was just a gift for me to hold. It's so not a gift for me to keep because mm -hmm. we're not, we're not, we can't take that with us to where we're going when we get to the other side, we can't take that. Mm -hmm. So I think that, um, I think that we are, we forget that people are gifting things to us. Like the knowledge that I have, is not mine? Mm -hmm. It's what I've acquired, but I have to give it back out mm -hmm. else it will be diminished. And I don't want, I don't ever want that to die. All of these, my ancestors fought so hard for for me for my existence and i owe it to them to fight hard to keep their teachings mm -hmm. and so i i work really hard i stay really busy because i don't want to get any of my time i feel like i wasted time while i was drinking and i'm still making up for that time mm -hmm. and i want to make sure that my daughter knows that time this time is important and that her time is spent well because my grandma's time was spent well and she got to live this great life. And she got to go gracefully and peacefully. And I want to feel like that when I leave. I want to feel like I gave everything that I could. Because the more that I give, more the more that I get. It's so crazy when people think that it's such a cliche, but it's not. You literally get so much more. And you get payment in different ways that you thought that that you were going to get like you think that you're going to expect you expect these other things you know and then you're given so you're gifted stuff that is so much better than you thought in such unexpected ways because I'm like sitting up here today you know and people want to hear what I have to say mm -hmm. and I have a beautiful daughter and I lived a beautiful life reflecting on it and you know there was lots and lots of hard parts but like it's so cool that the creator got to gift this to me like he got to give me this land he gifted me this breath he gifted me that great that great um, little sun that sunrise this morning that i got to see off the snow and i forget that i think that people forget that they're gifted this like you can look outside and you think oh my god it's snowing but look at how beautiful the snow is look at each individual snowflake are all different and the creator he put all of these tiny pieces together and he made me just like me he intended to make me exactly me and why would i waste that and i want my daughter to know that the creator loved him loved her so much he put all of these pieces together and said look look at this beautiful creation i made now go take care of mother earth and i will repay you Let's take care of each other and I will repay you. Because all of us are also we're also made up of gifts. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we forget that it's gifted. Yeah. And I forget a lot. And then I yeah. I'm like, nobody cleaned the dishes and nobody did this. And I'm like, oh shoot, look, I get to have a home with the people that I love. And I get to have, you know, my culture and I get to dance it out and I can work with whenever I want to. Mm -hmm. You know, and I get to sing my songs whenever I want to. I get to be whenever I want to. And before that, that could have not happened. Yeah. I could not be here. My daughter could not. She could have not been here. But I was gifted a great life. So I think that even the hard work, because I'm working so hard because I get these little payoffs. And in the end, it's going to be off. It's going to be great because I get to bathe in the light of the creator. So it's focusing. I, I hear this as spending so much more time on what you have and what you can give 
than what's broken and, and what's scarce. You know, it's a different... So yeah, you, broken, broken can be beautiful. Broken too. can be very beautiful, yeah. yeah. And sometimes you have to get broken to put the pieces back together in the right place. Yeah. Because the creator said, no, that's not right. <laughs> Let me show you. <laughs> I wanted to check in, Janice, with our online folks and see if anybody has any questions. Uh, no questions. Quite a few comments. Um, Anything you want to share? Yeah. Where should I start? <laughs> <laughs> um, I can, do you want me to just read through them? Just, uh, if there's a couple that make sense, I can come back to you if you want to pick out a few or yeah, um, if somebody has a chance for a question. Earlier, Rich says, uh, honoring elders, cousins, and brothers and sisters, all brothers and sisters, grandparents, having more time and parents to guide children, all Indian values, and we are finally listening to them talk about those values rather than trying to replace them with our values. Yeah. JC is making a beautiful statement. So sad that it took so many generations before. It is okay for us, Euro-Americans, to even listen to rather than eradicate. Um, let's see. Um, he also adds the purpose of boarding schools was to wipe out everything that JC is um, articulate. And I, I, I always say that too. I'm like, well, they try to make my grandma be quiet. They try to make my grandpa be quiet and I won't. So I have stuff to say. And I'm not fighting for me. I'm fighting for my daughter and I'm fighting for them. And it's easier to fight when it's not for yourself. It's easier to fight for somebody that you love more than yourself. And I think it's so awesome that my ancestors fought for me so hard and they didn't even know me yet. Wow. Yeah. They loved me so much and I didn't even exist yet. But they were willing to put, to put their life out there so that I could exist. I'm really proud of that. Okay. Um, hmm. So I want to ask you uh, a couple of questions that I asked our panelists earlier. I'm going to start with, can we talk? This is the theme. You know, what resonates with you on that? Is it, is it, if it's important, if you think it's important, can you talk about why? I think, um, like, can we talk? That's, I think that's something I probably say to my daughter all the time, <laughs> you know, or asking if it's okay, or ask, you know, I think that, I think that the question is a great question instead of just blurting out what you have to say and being able to ask them if you can talk, you know, because um, sometimes we're over emotional and it's not a good time to talk. And I'm glad that it was kind of named that, like when we went, we had that conversation, mm -hmm. because that's kind of what I wanted to put out. Like, if we just say it, then it's said. And now it's out on the table and we're not assuming that one of us is saying this or thinking this or whatever. So with my daughter, if I just tell her, hey, that hurt my feelings. I don't appreciate it when you do that. Then she knows. And she's not like, oh, my God, my mad mom was mad at me about this. Because I tell her why. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling her I'm mad at you. I'm sad because um, what you said hurt my feelings a little bit because of this. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're asking, if we're asking to have a conversation, mm -hmm. it's better than just talking at people. But I think when with my daughter, so I'll ask her a couple of times, but you know, if she doesn't do it, then you have to tell her. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it's good that we ask people if we can talk about it and giving them the right space to be able to talk because like at work, sometimes you get a little bit heated and I want to say something, but I, I probably shouldn't say something now, or, you know, I'm feeling a little bit too lippy and I don't want to, I might cuss and I better be quiet. <laughs> um, say, Hey, um, I can't talk right now. Um, can we talk tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I do want to talk about this. I do think we need to talk about this and not just thinking that if we don't talk about it, then it's going to disappear because that's how, you know, the, the conversations between me and my mom had went. I assumed that it was this and she assumed that it was that and she missed me and I just thought she was mad. So I stayed away. Mm -hmm. And when we could have just said it out loud and we could have avoided some of that. That goes back to your comment earlier about avoiding assumptions. Yeah. And also that I think it also ties back into comments that I made earlier about, again, it's almost that body check. It's that that realization that you are responsible for your own 
emotional state and your own reaction and having that forethought to say, yes, we can talk, but maybe not right now. You yeah. Because I don't trust what might come out of my mouth or I'm not going to give you my full attention. And that, yeah. and that gives my daughter the option to keep, uh, the, that gives her the okay to keep me accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to make sure that I'm being a good mom. And I want her to be like, hey, mom, I didn't like when you talked to me like that. And they could go, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. I didn't know that what that had hurt your feelings. Sure. Thank you for telling me I'm not going to say it like that anymore. Or I'm not going to bring that up about thinking I'm joking with her about something that's maybe not a time to joke about it. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, that happened a little bit too recent. Let's not joke about it yet. Yeah. You know, it's not funny yet. <laughs> it's like you're giving her the gift of not... And we need to funny. make those assumptions. So, I mean, I think that's something that's really interesting. It's not just about you not making assumptions. It's almost you're giving her that pass. I mean, it's by saying it hurt my feelings when you did this thing. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have to make the assumption as to why that is. And that's, yeah. that's a pretty remarkable thing to do for somebody. Um, I did want to ask one more question. Um, I asked in our panelists earlier, we talked a lot about um, a, a, during the last couple of days about fracture and fear and, you know, the divisions that are in our world and our society um, and how, why that's part of the reason why this conversation was so important to have this weekend. But I wanted to kind of close with well, what gives you hope? What gives you hope right now? Um. Well, the hope, I have hope within my family. You know, I have hope in my daughter um, that, you know, that I'm taking the right steps to correct the trauma within me. And that's also helping her, you know, so we don't always have to say, hey, I'm helping you. I'm helping you. I'm helping you by helping me and helping all of us. So I think that we need to make sure that we're looking in the mirror because I can't keep correcting her. And like when she picks up the bones, like what, mom? Because I probably was saying it to her like that, you know, so at least mirroring back, you know, what you're receiving, because maybe that's what you're giving. So I think that me uh, making sure that I'm checking in with myself to make sure that I'm doing okay, and that then I get to see my daughter doing okay, and that she's thriving in the place that she is. And then I get to pass that on to my nieces, and then I get to pass that on to my sisters, and hopefully that makes me stronger by making my family stronger by making my community stronger and i can't say i can't say oh it's going to be better because of what i'm doing i'm just the one i'm i'm the one doing it so i hope people will follow me because it's working for me it's working for me and my daughter and i know that there's breaks in other families and i hope that they can learn from me and that's why i want to share my story and that's why i want to you know make sure that my daughter knows that if somebody else is being ugly to somebody else, that she can stand up for them. So I think that by me helping myself, it's helping my daughter and it's helping more and more. And I hope that more people want to do that because it's working for me. Do I have any closing questions before we close this down today? I want to thank JC. I want to thank you for taking the time to be so vulnerable with us today and for sharing the stories. I, I know it means a lot to to our community, and we are very glad to have you as part of our Willowie County family and as part of our broader fish shop and all of our families. So I want to thank you for that. Um, so please, can we thank JC? Yeah.